It's a great pleasure to be here in BIC, as always. And this is a special moment for me, where my guru, Dr. George Schaller, is here. He's 86 and already 50 years younger than me. And Miriam Horn, who is a very renowned writer, who has taken on the challenge of writing George's biography. They are traveling together, and apparently, when she wanted to know from George what he wanted to do, because they had some travel related to where he had been, and he, I was very happy to hear, and I'm sure my colleagues in CWS of 30 years would be happy to hear George chose to come here first. So, so the event will unfold in, uh, in three bits. Uh, there is a biopic of uh, George Schaller, uh, which runs 55 minutes. This was made by someone, an old friend. I used to work for WCS for 30 years. Tom Weltry was our top movie maker. Then he set up his own uh, company called the Really Interesting Picture Company, and he pitched the idea to National Geographic to make a biopic of George. So we'll be showing that, and that really tells you who George is and... Uh, uh, what, a, what an incredible tough person he is. That will be followed by a three-minute clip about what happened and how they made the films, which shows you a completely different side of George. After that, we'll, uh, Miriam, George, and I'll come up on stage here. I'm supposed to moderate this. Nobody can moderate George. I know that. <laughs> but I'm, I'll moderate and try to draw George out, and that's where Miriam comes in. She's a professional in that. With that, we begin. Thank you. In 1991, I get an old landline phone call in Mysore where George Shaler called from Nairobi saying I had promised to take him to Nagarhole three years earlier. I had forgotten about it. So there George lands in Mysore, uh, and then we go to Nagarhole, we see the tigers. It was a great trip. Then he says, have you ever been to Kana? I said, no, George, I haven't been to Kana. You don't give me a budget to travel. How can I go to Kana? He said, no, I'll pay for it. You come with me. So we ended up in Kana. We go there. And of course, Kana is not the tiny piece of fragmented forest under threat of his time. It's this magnificent park with the forest department protecting it fairly well. And George is like God. It's like going there with God. So. The whole forest department was there to welcome him, take him, bounce him around on a jeep all over Kana. And wherever he go, they would trot out some 80-year-old caretaker, bring him out, and he would say something in Hindi. Wherever he go, these old guys would say the same thing. Usko do bacche te, pinjde me dalte te. OK, it translates as, he had two little kids. He used to put them in a cage. So, <laughs> and George was getting annoyed. He said, uh, I asked him, what are they saying? And I kept saying this, and he got very annoyed. And I asked George, wh wh what's the story? He says, no, Kay and the little kids were in the Kana meadow, on the edge of the meadow. So she had put a little bamboo fence to prevent the two kids, which you saw in the picture, they're professors, retired professors now, from wandering out. So, oh, then George said, fine. And as we were about to leave Kana, this is after a week of Forest Department hospitality, the park warden, the park research director came and he said, Dr. Scheller, it was wonderful having you over. You must come again. And this time you must bring your children. He says, I'll surely come, but I need a very big cage for them. They're adults now. <laughs> so Miriam has an assignment to draw George out and write this book. I don't envy her, uh, so I would like to come to George next. But Miriam, to say a few things about the book, about the challenge, and the experience so far. Thank you, Ulas, and thank you all for being here. I feel like a total interloper up here with two of the greatest biologists ever and a room full of other great biologists. Um, the Ulas had, met, had asked me earlier to talk both about the rewards and the challenges of this book. The rewards are of working on this book. The rewards 
I could talk all night on. They begin with the privilege of spending a lot of time with George Schaller and Kay Schaller and getting to meet his extended family um, and to wade through the incredible archives that George somehow managed to preserve through all these moves to all these different locations around the world that include the telegrams that he was receiving from the Wildlife Conservation Society headquarters in 1960 when war broke out with independence in the Congo. And George uh, took it upon himself to try to do some work which he might talk about to protect the gorillas as civil war was sort of erupting around him. And, the, and Fairfield Osborne at Wildlife Conservation Society was telegraphing, te sending telegraphs saying, George, get out. Um, and so the opportunity to wade through this history and spend time with them, um, it's, as you can see, it's the greatest story that has yet to be told. It's an unbelievably rich life um, with unbelievable significance for the, the world we all share. Um, and the, the, the other great reward that I'll touch on is the love and respect for George all over the world means that there isn't anyone I have called who hasn't moved mountains to, to help me on this book, beginning with Ulas, who um, is absolutely right that when I said to George, George, I have to go in the field with you. I can't write a biography of the greatest field biologist in history and not see you in the field any more than you could have written about the gorillas seeing them in the zoo. And he said, well, let's go to India. And this is the place he wanted to come. And when I wrote Ulas to say, will you help, Ulas immediately planned this journey that we're about to begin tomorrow, which I'm, I'm extremely excited about. And that story has been repeated everywhere with people bending over backwards, giving me time from all over the world and digging through old trunks to find letters from George or pictures of George. And um, that's just a, a tribute to the, the worldwide respect for what George has accomplished. The challenges are an equally long list. Um, and, and really, they begin with the fact that the, one of the first words that always comes out of people's mouth if you ask them about George is the word humble. George has never been someone who wanted to turn the light back on himself. Um, I'm not sure. I <laughs> I'm not sure yet that, um, you know, most people, if you're writing about them, you open a notebook and you ask them questions about themselves. Four hours later, they're still talking. Um, that's not the case with George. I ask him a question, he answers in one sentence, and he stops. He, um, so there is not, this, George doesn't seem to be of the generation that is deeply invested in self-exploration. And so that's a challenge for a biographer. Um, it's also tremendously challenging to be writing about someone who's still alive and who is as active as George is because so much of George's work is engaged with some of the most complicated issues around wildlife conservation and sometimes contentious issues. And so it requires me to try to understand well enough what those challenges and, and conflicts are in order to really embed George's story properly. And, the third challenge is the standard George has set um, as not only one of the greatest biologists, but also one of the greatest writers of the century. Um, if you have had the pleasure of reading his books, we all probably have different favorites, um, but George is a magnificent writer, and his description of a tiger stalk will have your heart in your throat without a single extra word, and so that that is an extremely daunting uh, standard to try to, to even be, I won't even, I won't approach it, but, but the sense of responsibility to do justice to George's life and to the standard George has set is a, feels like an enormous challenge. George, uh, you have, you know, the picture captures the width and depth of your work, uh, but to me, uh, there are four big countries you have worked in, which have huge populations, incredible wildlife, incredible challenges of development, uh, balancing development, human interests with the interests of these threatened species, which require very, very um, 
strong support to maintain their ecological fragility. They are very strong, but they are, from the extinction perspective, they are very fragile. So I'm talking about China, India, Brazil, and your own country, North America. So having looked at this for 60 plus years, 60, 70, close to 70 years, do you feel it's been worth it, whatever you have done, other than the fun you've had watching animals, has it been worth it? And what do you feel about the future in terms of going forward? Are you hopeful about these four countries? Oh my, that's a, you want a short answer? No, I want a long answer. She's already <laughs> complained about the short answer. Yeah. No, I've been extremely fortunate in that most countries I've worked in, I've been treated tremendously hospitably. I've had excellent co-workers who continued on. Well, the Congo was an exception. Uh, but was the Belgian Congo when it got independence they started a war that hasn't stopped yet. And I finally left when they started chasing me with machetes through the forest. So it was difficult to observe gorillas that way. Uh, but India had not only, for example, very good cooperation from the forest department, but from the tribal Baiga people who helped me a lot, who told me there's a tiger kill there, come and look at it, they brought me things and so forth. So that makes all the difference if you get the local support. Uh, China, well, one issue, if you want good conservation in the country, if you're a country that's democratic, elect a leader that knows something and is interested in conservation. Otherwise, you get leaders like a couple of countries I can mention, uh, one in South America, one in North America. Uh, so, but I mean, it's critical because conservation depends on politics, which is, depends on the leaders, what you have. So right now, China, for example, has a leader that is very interested in conservation, which means all the provinces are also then follow it. So they're setting up huge reserves. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to protect the environment. And so uh, it's a pleasure to work in that country, which I've now been done for 40 years. And for example, they just, there are a lot of little panda reserves. Well, they are too small to support a population that doesn't get terribly inbred and ultimately disappear. They just combined all the panda reserves, uh, about 60 of them, into one large national park. And they're building corridors so they can go between forest areas. So it's really planning for the future. And that's the kind of thing every country needs to do. And there's so much knowledge now. I'm very hopeful for the future. Now you've got people marching on behalf of climate change. If you don't change the climate the way it's going, most of you are going to be here another 30 or 40 years. And if you think you have problems now, wait what will happen with the rise in the sea water, the increase in temperature, the change in habitats. It's going to be extraordinarily difficult. So uh, now's the time for action. So I actually would, um, you know, that, oh, so the, you know, you just told sort of that the panda story is heading in a better direction than it has in decades. But I found the last panda your saddest book of all. And it seemed to me it was really the hardest work you ever did. And so I wonder if you could talk about what 
the challenges were when you were there. That I, I mean, I think it's a great example of a story that seemed really quite desperate when you were there, and yet has managed to move from a state of desperation to one of tremendous success. So could, can you talk a little bit about what was happening when you were there in the early 80s, that, that the difficulties that were coming down from the, the central government, the local governments, the panda rescue, all of the, the chaos that was underway then? Well, remember, China had closed its doors. China only said Americans were evil. Suddenly, but Panda is a national treasure. They're very uh, proud of it. And suddenly, this American shows up, and his government tells him, this American is going to work with your biologists. And hey, most of the people I worked with had never seen a foreigner. And they were very tense. And anything that I did or said was reported in great detail to the local Communist Party leader. So they were extremely tense because they knew they were being watched and punishments were and still have been very serious over there. But once they realized I was interested only in helping the panda, uh, they relaxed and we had wonderful years together. Well, but, but both poaching and these misguided rescues were both underway. I mean, the panda conservation was going in the wrong direction then, right? Well, there was poaching. Uh, the Japanese were paying $10,000 for a panda skin to hang on the wall, a trophy. Uh, so we radio collared some animals. A couple of them were snared by poachers. Uh, well, the one they caught got 15, year, 15 years in jail. But look, every conservation project, you run into endless problems. Let, look, uh, this film here showed just one pipeline in the Arctic National Refuge. Well, the United States had two presidents named Bush, and now they got a current one, I don't even mention his name, uh, that are working hard to open America's last great wilderness to oil drilling. Just next door is Prudhoe Bay, where they've drilled oil since 1968. And if you go to that place, the 800 square miles of roads, pipelines, dumped oil uh, pools, they just ruined that Arctic slope, hundreds of square miles. Well, you can't let them into uh, the last beautiful big Arctic area that the United States has, so you got to keep fighting. And the same with your tiger. Tiger after tiger country is losing its tigers. Uh, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia are finished. Thailand still has some. Nepal still has some. China, none except for a few visitors that come over from Russia. So you've got to constantly keep an eye on things you treasure. Um, so, George, I think your closest call with a predator was in India. Do you want to tell that story about when you were leaning on a rock watching the vultures? Oh, it's not a close call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, particularly the big cats, once they know you, if they see you every day walking around without any problem and you don't stare at them and so forth, uh, I've got snow leopards, so I could go sleep with them at night. Uh, this one time, I went up to a big rock and stood there, and sleeping on the rock was a tiger. And we looked up at the same time, and our faces were about this far apart, and we both looked surprised. <laughs> and I backed off slowly. You don't want to run from a 
predator because they're faster. Uh, and I climbed low into a tree and sat down, and a tiger came and sat underneath the tree and looked at me. And then the tiger's, uh, this was a young male. His sister came, and they sat and looked at me. And I clapped my hand and said, OK, go away, tigers. And they trotted off. <laughs> uh, so you have to learn how to deal with animals. Yes, any potentially dangerous animals, you got to be careful. Well, I'll ask you to tell one more tiger story, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to <laughs> Ulas, which, Ulas is, has far, far more. which is the story about when you and Kay were out watching tigers, and Kay had to go home to get the baby boy's lunch. Do you remember this story? And oh, well, living in Kana was lovely, because the cross department gave us a little bungalow, and the tigers walked right back and forth in front of the bungalow, among other things. So our two little kids, we couldn't let out to play alone because uh, tigers, a little kid walks unsteadily. Uh, and that's a trigger for a big cat that it's a sick animal. So I didn't want my kids being eaten by tigers. Uh, <laughs> but. They got used to me. I'd go past them at 15, 20 feet, and they're across somewhere, and I don't look at them and go on. Uh, my wife had a hard time getting used to that. Uh, we'd sit in the blind, and she said, I have to go uh, give our kids lunch. And I'd say, OK, go ahead. Uh, well, she wasn't very keen to walk out among the tigers to go home. But you learn. Well, I can tell you Kay tells that story a little differently. <laughs> what Kay says is that she was terrified, but she didn't want George to know she was terrified. And so she stood up tall and began to stride out in, in the mid, out to go home for these tigers. And George turned to her and went, shh, crouch down. Don't scare the tigers. <laughs> <laughs> and Kay at that point had confirmed that George's hierarchy of value, which came first when, it, when he had to make a choice. Well, as you can see, the <clears throat> major thing when you're out studying animals also is that you enjoy your work, have also respect, love, and compassion for the animals. That's what you really need to project to them. George, uh, you know, when I, I was, I first heard about you from my father. This was 1962 or 63. He was a writer, very interested mm -hmm. in nature, but basically a popular science writer and a novelist. And he brought this Book of the Month Club book, which was George's PhD on uh, mountain gorillas, and gave it to me and said, read this. Look at that man. He's studying gorillas out there mm -hmm. in the middle. He was, and I read it. Uh, but of course, my real turn on was tigers. So a few years later, in 1965, I was in engineering school and hating every minute of it at the National <laughs> Institute of Technology, Suratkal. My father brings a Life magazine and gives it to me. And I open it. That is a one and a half page article of George's on, uh, on his tiger study before the book came out. This was just a raw article with those brilliant strobe lit pictures of tigers on uh, uh, kills uh, by mm, buffalo uh, oh. yeah, yeah buffalo kills and uh, it just blew me away and as i read it i was training as an engineer you had to ask questions to solve problems and you have to be quantitative and that's what i got from it because i had read every tiger book every man eater book every jim corbett book but this was different mm. and at the same time, George wrote an, uh, the, uh, then in 71, I, uh, 68, I read an article in the Audubon magazine uh, where uh, George describes the status of wildlife in India. He had surveyed all of India to find one damn place where we could, he could go and see tigers. And that was this tiny nine square 
a 27 square kilometer patch in Kana. Rest of India, tigers are going, wildlife was going, forests were logged, people were cutting trees, shifting cultivation. You read that piece. It's a required reading for my master's students, that 1968 uh, article by him summarizing the wildlife. Mm -hmm. Things were, I, I never, uh, you know, I started going to the forest in 60s, 70s. I, it took me uh, 12 years before I saw a wild tiger. I know that scares me, Ola. Yeah. So <laughs> I only have 12 days. So no, no, I'm talking of 60s. <laughs> you wouldn't have been <laughs> probably around. So, uh, so the question is: Now you go. We go to these parks, like George said. I was when I was tracking tigers. We were sitting on the ground, and the tigers crossed right in front of us. You can go to Nagarhole, Kana. You see tigers now, wild tigers, and there are far more than they were, or at least there are the same number, but there's concentrated in a few places rather than going extinct everywhere. So there has been a change. You have met people who I've worked with for WCS, many of you are here who are with CWS. There has been a change in India. You are saying there's a chi China was viewed as a well, big suction pump to draw wildlife. That was its role, and it still is. It is still but is. there is this new change, which I also witnessed, new protected areas, young researchers, curious about nature. So overall, you know, things aren't always dismal. Many things have gotten better. Don't you think so? Oh, definitely. There's still so many places in the world that need attention from somebody like you. Uh, you can't go and say, I'm going to save everything in this country. You pick one spot that you think is worthwhile, spend time get solid information, go to government people that might be interested, give them all the data and make suggestions. But then don't leave. Come back and say, no, have you done anything? Mm -hmm. uh, that way you finally get something done because every country has some government officials that care and can get some action. So, uh, I would also add, okay. in an open society and a democracy like India with free press and things, we have a wider tool, a bigger toolkit to fight for conservation, mm -hmm. uh, unlike uh, some of these other places where you just can do it through the oh, government. Right. You don't have any other tools. You only have a hammer. Right. We have screwdrivers. We have spanners, many other things, yeah. which, which is a good way to deploy, somewhat like the US. Uh, I got my first copy of Deer, of Deer and the Tiger in 1971. It was not available in India. Some, mm -hmm. A friend from US sent it to me. And to me, it's the favorite book mm -hmm. of all George has written. Because in a, most other cases, he's written either a, uh, a serious scientific book and a popular book, virtually all his other studies. Mm -hmm. But on the tiger, there's only one. There is science, and there is unbelievably poetic prose. Mm -hmm. So it, that that's really my favorite. Yeah, well, so so George, the I know you think that your the legacy you will leave behind are people like Ulas and Kriti and the generate four generations of scientists in China who have worked alongside you and gotten and been inspired by you. How, what do you look for in a, when you spotted that Ulas was a talent or Alan Rabinowitz, who we saw in the film? What what do you look for in a, a younger naturalist that tells you that they are really going to be effective in their work? We never know if they're going to be effective, but you're looking for somebody that likes to be out, to roam around, uh, get away from the computer, get away from GIS and everything else. It's very useful. But if you want to know about nature, you have to go into nature. So if there's somebody that's really interested and say, I really like to watch minor birds, and I'm spending all my extra time watching minor birds, well, that's the right attitude, no matter what the species is. So uh, yes, get away from the technology, except for your binoculars and pen and paper, and get out and wander and enjoy and look closely at nature, listen, smell, and so forth. Like tigers, it's not just a beautiful animal. 
You can go through the forest and you pass a tree, you take a sniff, oh, the tiger has scent marked here. Now, which tiger was it, et cetera? Uh, so the tiger roars, it's a wonderful sound. Mm -hmm. Which tiger is doing it? The tigers all recognize each other. He used some stripes to recognize them and put in radio collars on them. Uh, radio collars is nice if you use the TIS ones, you don't even have to go in the field anymore. You can sit in your office and drink beer and watch the computer 24 hours a day. So you have to decide how best to help the animal and go after that. I think this is really the key for uh, today conservation has become somewhat fashionable. And I think access to too many discovery and National Geographic films make it all <laughs> seem like a movie and dream. Mm -hmm. The hard work involved in collecting good data that a field biologist really should prove his mettle on is actually that attitude is somewhat receding. There was a generation of Indians, uh, but in the younger generations, you find most of them gravitating to more comfortable sorts of mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. not really the tough field work that George talks about. Uh, as we were watching the movie, uh, one thing George always asked me is, uh, where are the papers? Where's the data? Where's the publication? So this is what we use as a metric as scientists. And he, was, he would ask me about virtually every young biologist he has met and this is where the point he brought up, which is that you try to pick the best people, you hope they stay the course, because conservation science, conservation itself is not a 100 meter race, it's a marathon. And, I, and that first encounter can be not necessarily, you know, the person may not like you. In fact, uh, Alan Rabinowitz, who was a dear friend of mine who is no more, who was also a mentee of George, just told me a story. He visited him in Tennessee, and they went for a walk. Alan was studying bats, I think. So uh, they went out, and he says, I fought with George all the time, and I'll probably never see him again. These were Alan's words mm -hmm. to me. And Do George comes back after all the fighting and hires him for WCS. <laughs> so George has a way of assessing. Mm -hmm. Today, while watching the movie on that Tiger movie, he asked me, what happened to the young guy? Has he published his thesis? Uh, Unfortunately, he hasn't. In fact, he has retired from conservation. Mm. So, so staying the course to me is what we should aspire to, but none of us can reach the level George has staying the course for close to 70 years. Mm -hmm. Well, and also incidentally, <coughs> what your daughter Chrissy does to teach young people in school to go out into nature is absolutely essential. And all schools should think of ways to send the students out, even just for a day or two, to see what nature is like. And this mentoring, I think, is really critical when you are a young biologist or a conservationist, mentoring by somebody who's stable, knowledgeable, and cares about long-term effects of the mentoring rather than pampering you for the moment. Too many professors coddle their students too much these days and turn out these puffballs. So uh, the George style is tougher, but I think it really, it really has a lasting impact. And uh, there is a story in Mahabharata, our great classic, uh, that describes this. The greatest teacher of archery, Dronacharya, uh, was teaching all the princely class students of his, but there was a uh, student from a backward community who would not be allowed into those circles. So what he did was created an image of this great archery teacher and practiced intensively and became a better archer than all the princes. And finally, he goes to this great archery guru and says, uh, you know, when you learn from a, uh, under the traditional system, when you learn from a guru, you have to give the guru a gift when you are 
finally kind of through and you are competent. So he goes and asks the guru, uh, what, should, what gift should I give you? I have learned from you. Well, the guru hadn't seen him. It was just the mm. icon that he had, mud icon. And the guru thought very quickly and said, this guy will beat all my students. So he's, he asked for his index finger as his <laughs> gift. <laughs> so unlike <laughs> poor Ekalavya, I was lucky. George hired me, gave me a salary. <laughs> <laughs> So as much no body parts. <laughs> yeah, no body parts. <laughs> I would be curious about who, how many people in this room are. Yeah, we can open up. Now. Are young wildlife biologists or, want, or who have found inspiration in George? You're under thirty, and you want to to you are doing or want to do bi conservation biology. Is show of hands, please. Show of hands. That's pretty great. We'll be counting on you. Oh. Uh, at this point, we seek questions from the audience. Let me lay some ground rules, please. Uh, uh, because there are a lot of people, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions, and we have a time limit. Uh, be very brief. Ask your question very clearly, and specify to whom the question is addressed to, and hold the mic close, close to your mouth. And, uh, uh, Perhaps not statements of intent and philosophy of life and various <laughs> other things that pop up at random. Very specific to either one of them. Not, not for me. I keep coming back. So this is primarily about them. But Chris's questions uh, and George's hearing is not as good it was mm, during those tiger days. So you have to be very clear and loud if you ask questions to him. And tell who the question is directed to. Thank you. Olas? Yeah, go ahead. Olas? Uh, this is Pallav Bagla. I write for the science magazine and also been a follower of George for, what, almost 40 years. Uh, a quick, short question to both of you. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of change happening from the pug mark to the estimation techniques using uh, camera traps. Uh, and a question to both George and Ullas. Uh, how much of the data today we see is fudged? Uh, there's a, estimates that the tiger numbers are grossly overestimated and the pictures are duplicated, uh, both to Ullas and to George. You please answer. Uh, <laughs> you, you have done this work. I don't use camera traps. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll answer very briefly. This, uh, you know, this is a kind of a well-discussed subject. There is, there is stuff out there. In my general opinion, uh, science grows by peer review process. And in India, the official mecha mechanism of managing or monitoring tigers is not based on a peer review process. So while there has been spectacular success on ground in recovering tiger populations because of the hard work of the forest department and its uh, military-like work culture, it has not worked well for promoting science. So a lot of the science out there, the good science is there, bad science is there, but the good science uh, to get it applied to this task is very hard. Uh, but given the very big picture, my view is there were about 2,000 tigers or so estimated by various people, not, not just pug marks, very experienced naturalists and things. There are probably about 3,000 now, and this has been known to us for many years. So the numbers are pulled up and down is a different issue. So I feel after 50 years of effort and such passion and such loss of life and investment, if we have gone from 2,000 to 3,000, and now bureaucrats are saying 3,500 is the maximum we can have when the carrying capacity for tigers potentially is uh, uh, 15,000 tigers in India. Uh, I, I think that sort of sums up the story. Any other questions? Yeah. Somebody has to give a mic to the guys. Yeah. Whoever gets the mic gets to ask the question. Uh -huh. <laughs> George, uh, through your experience, uh, 
what do you understand about poachers psychology like why why do they do that is just profession for them or anything else why do poachers hunt animals what is their psychology well the psychology behind hunting is very easy uh some trophy hunters want to brag about what they've shot or uh, a poacher that shoots a tiger or a musk deer or a rhino it's to make money straightforward as that you sell tiger parts you can make $10,000 if you have the right connections and for people that don't have much money i can understand it a lot of people what we call poaching a local people that simply want some meat to eat working for example in the amazon a lot like i do the local people don't have livestock in the rainforest and so how do they get meat they can grow some small crops but if they want meat they got to go out and shoot a deer or a monkey or something so do you call it poaching i don't call that poaching even if it's illegal because they want to make a living but if you kill a tiger for its body parts that is a serious breaking of the law and again i can understand why somebody wants to make more money but then it's up to the government to control it and tigers are now getting scarce so the poachers are in brazil killing jaguars they are here in india also killing snow leopards uh they killing any big cat because once it's bones and ground up you can sell it for tigers to china so uh, all the cats are in danger now from the medicinal trade so uh, dr shawler uh, my son also wants to wants a question if you allow two of them included in one that's fine otherwise i i'm i'm happy to forego my question mine is a short one anyways you want to start first or uh on the other side mine would be uh, do you see a movement where we are giving back to nature large tracts of formerly degraded lands or protected ecosystems and of course then you know the larger question of linkages to climate change so is that a trend that's of course obviously very very required considering how more deeper and fragmented we've become and uh, would you want to this is madhav um hopefully following me apart but um, he's going to turning 8 this january itself animals look so beautiful in the nature and in the forest so why do they have to go to the zoo why do you have to, why do they have to go to the zoo so his the, the child's question was about why animals go to zoos and the father's question was about whether there's any recovery of degraded lands whether there's any new lands being added in, in, in the zoo from through zoos no these are two separate questions so the child's question uh, i answered the zoo question okay so his, the father's question was whether you see a movement for lands that have been degraded to be recovered for wildlife anywhere in the world uh so i'm not very good at hearing that's why i have translators <laughs> in the english uh my apologies i should have yes often the easiest way to recover land is to leave it alone uh however with climate change a lot of the grasslands are going to turn into desert a lot of the forest areas are going to have no water and die or they're going to get flooded so there's serious serious problems ahead and so far uh people have been basically in denial that's now slowly changing but if a country can spend trillions of dollars building warplanes and bombs to kill more people 
they could spend those billions and billions of dollars to help the environment because everything you want, need, and have depends on nature. If you destroy nature, you destroy yourself. Globally, are these protected no, areas? No, no, we need to and go to the And what about the zoo? Yeah. Yeah. What was the question about the zoo? Well, I, well, yes, don't forget the zoo. The question was... Ah, the, okay, the zoo question I'll ask before the mic comes. Uh, zoos are where many people get edu educated about wild animals. And it's not necessary that if the animal is not in the zoo, it would be living in the wild. It would simply be not be living. So zoos have a role if they are run well and managed well, and not for all species, for some species. Uh, hi. Uh, my question would be to George and to Ulas as well. Uh, since both of you are field workers, what is your thought on field biologists or photographists being a passive ob observer and not interfering in, let's say, crucial animal life movement. For example, they're starving. But many people believe you shouldn't do anything as an observer or as a recorder or as a scientist. What would be your thought on that? Shall I quickly translate it for you? Quickly? Yeah, or you can answer. Uh, I like, no, but I would like to hear <laughs> your answer. Uh, basically, when you are a naturalist or a photographer, you are seeing a wild animal suffering from a natural cause. Should you intervene or not intervene? That's an interesting moral question. Uh, often, naturally, animals die. So if it's a small one animal dying, do you take it home? Do you take it to a zoo or what? That's your decision. Uh, if it's many animals dying, what is the cause? Uh, in the Serengeti National Park, you had feral dogs running around, which you have lots here in the mountains and all over Asia. Well, the feral dogs transferred canine distemper to the lions. 2,000 Serengeti lions died within a year. So uh, again, there you can interfere. The government started inoculating the dogs. And it really depends on the situation. Often the best thing is to leave it alone. It depends what it is and what is causing it and so forth. So there are many options. Uh, my quick answer would be, it depends, as George said, on the context. But if it is a species that's reasonably abundant and predation, for example, is a part of nature, I think we should leave that alone. But in some cases, when they are down to like the last 50 Javan rhinoceros and very small populations of the Mauritius kestrel, possibly you may have to at least pull it into captivity and try to keep it in, alive in captivity. And as far as, and it's certainly not domestic animals. Be, one of the biggest threats to wildlife is proliferation of wild, uh, domestic animals, including livestock, dogs, all these things. And certainly being kind to them inside a uh, protected area meant for endangered species would not be my suggestion. Uh, hi. So George here. Yeah, my question is for George. So I wanted to ask him that uh, what has kept him um, like going and put his this extra amount of effort that he has put in and uh, the f tremendous amount of field work he has done, like the key thing, the key emotion or the principle that is behind this. What drives you? What drives <laughs> yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, self-analysis is very difficult. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's a whole lot of combination of things. I enjoy being out just sitting watching animals, trying to learn something about them, roam around the forest and so forth. So that's essential. If you don't like being out, you don't do it. But then I see an area or an animal being mistreated, suffering. I want to see what can you do to help because it's so unnecessary. We have the knowledge now to stop all this. But most people are not interested in nature. That's why it's so important to raise young people 
to be interested in nature, so they take steps to protect more than just themselves and earn a living. Um, question for Miriam, if I may. First, my sympathies on having to tackle this job. <laughs> Thank you. And how do you pick and choose out of a life, the range of which I hadn't realized until now, how are you, what do you think is going to be the shape of what you will write? And for Dr. Shala, if I may, will new technology offer some hope? I mean, something like this um, in vitro fertilization of the last white rhino, I think, Sudan, that the, the last male died in a few years ago, but they, I think they're trying to grow from earlier collected semen, the last two female rhinos. Is there hope for, I don't know, continuing species that way? Or is that just reaching too far? Oh, as you get the technology to clone cells to make a new animal, uh, it's sort of intriguing. I hope they don't do that to make more people. <laughs> uh, so some, you can't stop technology. Hello. Uh, so let us hope it is useful technology to survival of this planet. Saras, quickly, uh, the issue is animals are going extinct because there are pressures on the habitat. Producing these cloned animals and putting them in will have the same outcome. So it's, it, it has some use in captive management of animals, but it's not the big solution for loss of wildlife. Uh, Miriam, I would like to really listen to yeah, your Yes, oh man, that, that's the question that keeps me up at night um, because uh, well, I can tell you that just the book proposal <laughs> that I, I ended up putting out to publishers, and, and I should say that Penguin is Penguin is publishing it. With, I, ha, I got the house and the editor of my dreams. And when I told George, I, so that we, I signed the contract in August. And when I wrote George to say that Penguin Press was publishing it, and he said, "Oh, that's a, that is that's wonderful news. That's a good publisher, especially because it's an animal." <laughs> and and when I told the editor in chief and got off that, she said, "Oh, well, maybe you should have gone with Gray Wolf Press." Then. <laughs> um, so. The, the proposal I sent out just summarizing George's life, just the skeleton of it and trying to touch on all the various ways in which it has, he has transformed science and conservation and life on Earth, took me 85 pages and we're aiming for a 400 page book. So it is going to be, you know, panning for the gold. I mean, fortunately, I, because George has written his 18th book will come out in the coming year from Yale University Press on Mongolia. My goal is to not, there's no reason for me to repeat what George has done. So what I'm really going to focus on is bringing out, you know, because George has kept the focus always on the animal, he once under duress in Tibet Wild was, un, you know, un, with a gun pointed to his head, wrote one short chapter on himself. But so my goal is to really focus on the parts of the story that haven't been told about George. And, you know, I of course can't, well, the, I will need to tell enough of the science to capture the impact that he has had on the world. But that, and you know, and then it just becomes, I mean, any writer, it becomes a, what's the single best, you just, you just scoop out the gems like you're gold panning, so. Thank you. Uh, this, is a, <coughs> this is a question to Dr. George. Uh, what would you think would happen to scientific rigor with increased, uh, what shall I say, corruption of conservation biology by sociological thought? Uh, I'll frame it a little more politely. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, he's one of Bangalore's leading ornithologists, and his his question is, insights from biology about saving animals, are they getting diluted or sidetracked by infusion of too much social science? By social science, you mean communities? Or? No, no. By 
in attempts to integrate social science into conservation, has it gone overboard to the extent that biological insights are being pushed aside about what is needed to save animals? But, but you're talking about social science of people? Yeah. Oh, OK. Because uh, social science of animals is more interesting to me. And <laughs> They can't, they can't talk back, so it's my interpretation that counts. Uh, no, but it's a very valid question, because you're not going to save anything unless you get to know what the local communities in an area want, like, and so forth, so you can focus on the conservation that includes them. Usually, conservation is done. Money is dumped on an area. The communities don't get anything out of it other than it's simply put there. Uh, you have to involve them, and that's important social science, because in the end, they're the ones that are going to save it, no matter what the laws are. Uh, if I can add a point to, Krishna, the point you brought up, I think critical, rigorous social science that addresses the questions of conservation is essential component along with solid biology to make conservation work. I think the problem is in the name of social science, a lot of political correctness is being injected. So it is not really corruption of biological science by social science, it's just bad social science or fantasies that are coming in. Uh, sir? Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank you so much for your work, sir. It's a real privilege to be in this space with you. Um, my question to Dr. George is, uh, conservation is often, especially in India, as we all know, pitted against uh, poor indigenous people's rights, unfortunately. So as a leading conservationist, what is your advice for those thinking about conservation when uh, you know it's coming into conflict with uh, indigenous people's rights or poor people's rights who happen to live around the area that needs to be conserved. What is your advice? What is your take on this conflict? Help me with part of the question. Oh, okay. no. uh, the question was, when you are saving endangered species yeah. in protected areas, it has ad adverse consequences for other users of the same habitat, including many oh, local right. communities. Yeah. How do you balance it, or what's your take on this issue? You have to find ways to help the local people. For example, your national parks, you pay entry fees. What percent of those entry fees are given to the local communities to help protect the park. Well, if not, that's a huge error. Uh, for example, we were seeing the mountain gorillas. And now it's over $1,000 an hour for tourists to watch mountain gorillas for each person. Well, 80% of all the money that's made from the tourism is giving to the local communities to hire guards, to hire, build medical facilities, to build schools, to give advanced education. So the local people really <coughs> benefit and that then makes them also proud of it. And you have to find ways to include the local people and also help them make a living at it. And most governments ignore that. And it's time to change that. OK, we have time for two more quick, short questions. Somebody with a mic? Okay. Young woman over here. We need to wrap up at 8. We have gone half an hour over. So whoever has the mic. Uh, hi, George. So I, I just wanted to uh, know that, I mean, given that uh, these times where there's a lot of urbanization happening and the decrease in uh, forest land, what should the government be uh, interested to do with respect to conservation? A, should it be looking to increase their population? 
given the space that it has, two, either maintain the population, or three, stop its reduction. So where should the government be focused at? That is on you. No, no. The question is for you. I'll frame it for you so you hear it clearly. Uh, the question is, given the rapid development, should the primary policy focus of conservation be on increasing animal numbers, wild, wildlife numbers, maintaining them at the present levels, or at least stopping them from declining? What should be the policy? You can't generalize. It completely depends on the local situation, what is necessary to do it. Uh, there comes a certain point. You don't want to increase tigers in a certain reserve because extra tigers will leave and go into cultivation and cause you other problems. In others, which are very, very few animals, what is Australia going to do now after forest fires and most of the forest for koalas and other wildlife is gone? So again, those, it's such a broad question, I can't give you a precise answer. One last, uh, you have a mic? Or you can yell, you're close by. Why to conserve anything? Yeah. Wildlife. If you don't conserve, what are you going to have after you destroy everything? That's a good way to commit suicide. <laughs> OK, so thank you all uh, for coming. I've had this mic for about oh, five sorry. minutes. Okay. Could I please okay. ask one question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sorry. <laughs> I'm Dr. Chinaya, and I've been doing science education programs with children for the past 15 years. Uh, one of the things I do is take children into the forest and do estimations of wildlife populations. I'm trying to take them to different locations. George, I was wondering, do you have places uh, where we can take students as a group um, to get them inducted into um, ideas of conservation and wildlife uh, in part of your organizations. Yeah, I, 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 George is, is not running any organization now, but there are plenty of opportunities. We have CWS volunteers who you can connect with. We do have programs for both children and for uh, training professionals in animal sampling and things of this kind. Okay. So, uh, Ravi is not here, so I'll wind up on behalf of BIC and uh, CWS. Thank you all for coming. It's been a great evening. Uh, and of course, those of you who are very young, when you are 86, can say, I have seen George Schaller. Thank you.